YouTube is giving us issues again. Right. YouTube. Is it because they fully transitioned to the new beta or the new studio? I don't know. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you're watching, we are trying to get uh, YouTube going. And we will be starting here in a second. So Marie is going to entertain you <laughs> while I get YouTube functioning again. I will do my best. Um, I hope everyone had a good long weekend to start off. We did have Monday off. I know it may not seem like it since, you know, there's still some shelter and home orders still in place. But hopefully you got to step away from the computer and step away from any phones and anything like that and spend some time. It did rain here, though, so we didn't get to go enjoy, you know, even at least on my balcony or in your backyard. If you have have a backyard, we didn't get to enjoy that just because it was pretty rainy this weekend. Oh, was it? Yeah, it was pretty rainy. Mm hmm all right. Oh, it looks like we are live. It's saying we are live now. Yep, got the notifications here. Okay. Let well, us know where you're watching from, Let's everyone. Let's double check. check today. I'm on my wrong screen here. I'm not... Oh, it, it kicked over right on time like it was supposed to. We're going to switch back to the main screen. Get this thing started from the <laughs> beginning because you guys... You guys deserve the full meal deal experience. So let's yeah. sting her back over here. All right. Double check. We may not have our YouTube comments uh, today because uh, YouTube is giving us some warning errors with VMix. Let's not close that. We're just, I'm just going to quickly jump over to Facebook and make sure we're all live on Facebook. You guys are being awesome. Don't be sure to comment either, though. I have the, uh, the YouTube video pulled up on my phone as well, so I could always see the live comments. Yeah, Maria Maria takes care of you guys no matter what. All right, we're just going to double check to make sure our live stream, and Maria's going to restart our teleprompter. It was a busy job today. It looks really like we are live on YouTube, on Facebook as well. So, whew, what a day, guys. So I took on, full confessions, I took on way too big of a project, um, which is my want, where I will often try and tackle far too much in one go. So that never happens to, to you guys, does it? <laughs> Nobody ever takes no one ever on too much. Off more than they can chew. Never me. So uh, let's get ready to get going. Like I said, I tackled this huge deal uh, over the weekend. My Memorial Day weekend was spent reviewing almost five hours worth of footage to try and wow. condense it all down into short videos, and that was a much that was a much bigger pro process than I thought it would be. So we're going to start here in about 20 seconds. Thank you all for joining us today on our live stream here at Pee Wee Texas, and I'm going to restart the teleprompter one last time. Uh, At least you know what's working. Keep and we know, yeah, 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 we got a good teleprompter going <laughs> oh, no. on. Ah, and it's being difficult. <laughs> we'll just skip it. Okay. Welcome, everybody, to the best of 2019. Uh, we, Marie and I, were talking about what we thought went well last year, what could be better. And frankly, I'm going to reset the teleprompter one last time, see if we can get it to stop arguing with you. Uh, and today, we're going to hit the top live streams from 2019. We're going to summarize the best content from the videos, which I spent my weekend doing, to bring you up to date on where our guests are today. So, I'm your Pewee guru, Tyler Andrews. And always, I'm joined by my lovely co-host, Miss Maria Medell. Yes. And I'm going to help her with a teleprompt because it's about <laughs> work. Of course, and we need it to <laughs> work. Um, so yes, thank you, Tyler. Welcome, everyone. As Tyler mentioned, we were looking back at some of our streams from last year to see what went well and what could be done better. So we did start looking at our top live streams, our top five, top ten, and we realized that there is some important stuff that we feel is actually worth looking back on and getting up to date on. So today, we'd love to get y'all's feedback on what topics you'd like us to cover for the rest of this year. Um, do y'all want to see more streaming tech, more digital buildings, or something we haven't covered at all? We did take a poll on our Facebook page last week as well from the top three 2019 streams. Huey Lighting was by far the absolute favorite. It was. No no shock, no surprise no. here. And we will cover that for you. Yes, it was a landslide. <laughs> <laughs> uh, so what would like to what do you want to see? Ooh, what do you want us to see cover 
um, we hit up hit up the chat lines for us um, and then shoot us an email to let us know what you what you're up to or what you've been up to in any of these topics. So without further ado, let's go ahead and see what Converge POE's best of 2019 was. Let's do it. Well, um, thank you very much, uh, Maria, for getting us started. Teleprompter is going to be giving us fits all day. We're going to, so today, uh, we're just going to dive right into this. So I'm going to start us over. Um, and get our titles up. Right. There we go. So, uh, uh our third most popular vid live stream from 2019 was actually when we covered uh, the using an iPad as a video source mm -hmm. for live streaming. Yes. And it was a, it was a very interesting video, very popular. It was. Um, but uh, if when when we go back and you see the review, the abridged version of the video, you're going to see that we had issues with the NDI and the RPOE to lightning adapter. So uh, without further ado, let's just dive in and see uh, this video. I'm gonna just get us right over to it. I tried the cameras for OBS and um, you know, I'll just, you know, spoiler alert, they were not materially better than the NDI cameras. In fact, the, both the NDI cameras were slightly better in my opinion. So I'm going to bring up a video here to show me setting up this iPad. So you download the, the, the app onto your phone or tablet. And a quick note here, make sure to enable the camera and microphone. It took me a day to figure out why it wouldn't come on. The, the, the app gets upset if you don't do both. And then um, a quick note here, Chris, you were talking about the latency. Um, you need to sacrifice a little quality for speed. Uh, we found that the quality bar on the app, when it was at its maximum, it, it was getting a little laggy uh, to vMix. And um, let me see if I can show you what that looks like. I'm going to bring this up. This is me trying to do a balance setup on latency. So here's my hand. I'm just snapping it here. You can see it's a it's a fairly balanced. Uh, it's definitely not great for sports. If you're doing like really fast, you can see some of the loss with your hands. Um, and um, I'm going to show you how you actually bring up as an input into vMix. You simply come down to input. Uh, you pick an NDI capture, and then here it is. You just uh, select the the item and bring it on. If you're playing around with multiple apps, like the old NDI app and the new NDI app, uh, don't try and run them both on one iPad. It, it starts really confusing OBS and vMix, and it gets the cameras all confused. So this is the NDI HX camera from Sienna. And um, here's the bad news. Uh, this is one of the better, uh, like if you look at the latency, I'm going to wave my hand over the top. It gets very good latency to, uh, to end to OBS. Let me see if I can get my hand in front of the camera. I'm not sure I'd recommend having four or five iPad cameras all trying to run on the same NDI network. You can see I'm getting some latency here. So if you can see the screen here, basically it says that uh, you need NDI 4 SDK. In vMix, I called Tom over at Streaming Idiots and Tom said vMix cannot support NDI 4. Um, which the new app requires. Uh. All right, guys, so that was awesome. You got to go back and see the refresh and where we left it at the end of 2019. Mm -hmm. You know, we talked about Switcher Studio, what was good about it, what was not so good about it. Now, the good news is uh, we've had an update yeah. in, in a bunch of different ways, and Maria's done her research on it. So I'm going to let Maria talk about what the research has told us. Yep. So the most um, prominent new news I found is that 
um, through June 1st, NDI HX camera and capture actually free on iTunes. They're free. They're oh free. my gosh, and I paid a fortune <laughs> for that thing. I know. It used to it used to cost I think twenty and then ten dollars respectively. Um, they're actually free. I think they okay. did. I think they did it just with everything going on. Um, people needed to stream with their loved ones and coworkers that you know are in remote locations. So they did put it through June first. Um, there are also, there were also so many articles and videos on this while I was looking into what's new. So everyone's very excited and very popular um, about it about it being free <laughs> to, <laughs> to spend their money. Um, and then uh, it was also announced earlier this month. Around, oh, yeah, it was mentioned uh, during the quarantine orders. So people seem to jump on it. Um, and you can also layer other assets such as a screen capture, another NDI device, lyrics, et cetera. People were mentioning scripture because I know it's very popular to stream for churches. Oh, very so cool. You can, actually, you can actually add layers to that. So you can add scripture and lyrics if you're using it in a church setting, which is very popular to do so. And then the most used software to use still appears to be OBS, which is open broadcaster software, um, OBS Studio on iPads. Um, but we actually use vMix here, which we touched, mm -hmm. we touched on on our last video. So it, OBS is now functional on iPads. So you can run an OBS Studio right from an iPad. Yes, they can now be integrated with each cool. other. Very cool. Okay. Yep. And then we also went back and tested a different adapter to stream with. As Tyler mentioned, we did have some latency issues when we used our Lightning PD the first time around. Um, so we did stream it with the, the Belkin adapter on NDIHX to see what the latency was like on that one. So first off, well, that, and, and a note, sorry, mm -hmm. I need to interrupt. I apologize. Uh, vMix did an update where they added the newest version of NDI. Yes, they Were did. Were you going to cover that? I was. Oh, I'm sorry. <laughs> no worries, but that's what I was going to say is that first off, we did find that NDIHX can actually be integrated with vMix, which was exciting for us to see since that is the streaming software that we use. Um, and secondly, the latency actually didn't seem to differ that much from our Lightning PD this time around. Um, so the Belkin adapter and Lightning PD actually seemed to have the same latency, and they were both quite good, to be honest. They weren't too bad. They weren't too slow or laggy. Yeah, hello. <laughs> um, and then the first time around, it looks like there might have been either an iOS update on the iPad itself or with an NDIHX as they were doing their updates to where the latency was no longer an issue. So they both had significant latency. Well, yeah, when we first started our Lightning PD, the latency had a significant issue, um, but it seems like that's been resolved now with some updates. Yeah, sorry, I cut you off there. And what, what I brought up is this is an iPad, and this is not even the, the newest version. It's this is not. just an iPad 7.9, 9.7. Yes. 9.7 um, with the camera. So you could see pretty good on latency. Uh, you're kind of seeing some of our background here be behind us. And this one's with the Lightning PD, correct? This is using our GF Lightning PD. Yep. So much better, much improved since last time if you saw the previous cut when we tested it. Yes. Much improved. Much improved. And Chris, actually, I believe it's Chris Zayon. Yeah, Zayon? Chris has come up to see us. Chris lives down in San Antonio. He's yes. been up to see us. Hey, Chris, how you doing, buddy? And he was commenting a lot on our first video we covered on this, and now he's back to us to see what the review is like. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you for coming back, Chris. Yeah. You'll have to tell us. Uh, what's your vote based on this? I'm yes. waving at the camera. Hey, hey, how does that look? Uh, you can see it next to our streaming camera and the iPad. I think, you know, frankly, I think... That this has stepped it up a grade. I would I so. use this as a camera. Yeah. One thing I did notice, which many people probably notice anyway when you use an outside app other than the camera on the iPad, is that it does affect um, which part of your view is zoomed. So when you do just a regular camera app, you get a little bit more wider range that it can view, but when you use the NDI camera, it does cut it off a little bit. So it's, it kind of zooms in a little bit more, so just be aware of your frame. Okay, cool. Well, what questions do you all have about this from Facebook or YouTube? Uh, what do you? What would you like to know about using an iPad for a streaming media? Yeah, let us know. Yeah. So we'll keep an eye on the chat lines. Uh, it takes you usually takes a second for all the feedback to get to us. But uh, and I'll turn this camera off because it's got to be very annoying to see us in two places. As <laughs> handsome as I am, very meta. I, I can't. I can't believe anybody wants to see me uh, that much. So um, let's. Move on to video number two. So this was a uh, a very exciting and a very cool video out there. Yeah. And it is in line with what we were talking about with the PoE lighting before. Mm -hmm. uh, by far, our most popular videos, and I'm going to update my title here. By far, our most popular videos were about PoE lighting and automation. Uh, or in other words, the digital intelligent building. And we actually had three very popular shows. Uh, one with the Sinclair Marriott team who have gone on to do some very interesting things that we'll get to. Yes. Don't worry. 
and two with the Igor team. Uh, Igor does the the Igor Technology does building automation. We actually got to sit down with their founder and one of their top guys who's out there getting the product in in the world. Now I I have a confession to make. Unfortunately, uh, I only had one weekend to edit these videos. And I was only able to get to the first video that we did with Igor's founder, Dwight Stewart. So I'm, um, but I'm going to come back to that. Sorry, that comes later in the show. I want to start with the highlight reel from when we spoke with Hannah Walker and Nathan Galbraith, the team that helped realize the Sinclair Marriott. So let's kick them off. And I'm adding each of the original videos for you guys in the chat line, so you can go back in case you missed it, or if you just want a refresher. Fantastic. We are, I can't tell you how excited I am to have you on, our, both of you on our show today, because uh, because these, everyone out there, these two are the boots on the ground making the POE happen. So we can get, I'm hoping you guys will give us the inside perspective on how a POE building comes together. So we're doing all of the lighting, we're doing all of the powered motorized window curtains and shades. We're doing all of the door locks. We're doing all the typical like cameras, access points, all that stuff. Um, we're doing uh, our electric mirrors in our bathrooms. So it's like a mirror that has a TV. Uh, you can play music. You can order room service. We're doing our mini bars. Um, and we are working very closely with LG and for our next project, we should have the televisions and AC power, air conditioning, VRF units, also PUE. So that's, that's kind of our next step. We weren't able to get that in time for Sinclair. Now, out, out of curiosity, do you mind sharing what prompted the decision? Farouk, uh, owns a few other hotels in the area. Uh, one of the hotels was just built, I think three years ago. Um, and during the construction of that, he wanted to put in a um, a smart lighting system so you could dim the lights mm -hmm. and do everything like that. And so spent the money, installed the whole thing. Uh, but when it was time to turn everything up, uh, it just didn't work. The installers Freaking were worried at the manufacturer. The manufacturers, you know, saying the installers did it wrong. Uh, and it, it got to a point where Farouk um, just got fed up with it. And he said, fine, we'll just not use it. And I'll come up with my own way to do things. And so that's what started um, his dive into POE lighting. And then uh, when that, um, once he got rolling with that, it kind of just opened up a lot of doors for other fields uh, to go into. And just basically started with lighting. Uh, then he realized, okay, we have 60 watts on a Cisco switch. Uh, what can we power with 60 watts? And so um, VRF air conditioning cassettes uh, fall into that range. Uh, we had, for a little bit, a full-size refrigerator mm -hmm. running off of a POE port. Um, and just we're just uh, kind of talking with different manufacturers saying, hey, your product only takes 45 watts of power. Uh, why don't you try to make it POE? So I would say besides the energy savings, by putting in a completely POE infrastructure, you save a lot of other things up front, including uh, electrician cost, because it's all low voltage, conduit, um, space in the IDF. <clears throat> so there's a lot of cost savings up front, but um, a lot of Cisco switches, our CDBs, we've been running here for about three years and we haven't had any issues with them at all. Um, so you, I know there is a life uh, end of life for Cisco switches, but I think that the energy savings in this building, when we replaced, this is our office building, we replaced three floors of uh, POE lighting. We did the CV, we have a CVS on our first floor and second floor. And when the total energy savings from the transformation we did, we, we took out our old air conditioning system and did VRF. And then we powered all of our switches with digital electricity as well, which is another technology we'll talk about later. Um, but we've saved about 30% energy cost. So it does, I think it does recoup. I wouldn't know exactly the one-to-one -one cost yeah. savings, but it's it's very, it's very a very dramatic cost savings. Yeah, and um, a big part of it is, uh, since we did just start doing this just a few years ago, uh, we haven't gotten to the point where we've needed to replace any of our POE infrastructure. Um, 
but I know that um, some people don't want to use Cisco because it is a little bit more expensive. But there are other PoE manufacturers out there that make. Uh, uh, <laughs> yeah, who'd, who'd have thought? Uh, make other, you know, um, more affordable and just as good, uh, if not better, uh, equipment. So uh, there are ways. Yeah. So, no, did getting permits for something this new cause a problem? We had a, we had the entire every city official basically come to our office when we installed everything here. And what we did was we had an IP phone and it was plugged up to a Cat5 cable. And then whenever we unplugged it from there and plugged it into a light and the light came on. And so right now the city of Fort Worth, it says that every light fixture has to be installed by an electrician. And so when we did this demonstration and we said, does an electrician need to plug in this IP phone? Then the city officials were like, no, that doesn't make any sense. So they gave us basically a, a complete approval to do this PoE lighting and other PoE devices um, without having to have electrical inspections. There are no codes right now regarding PoE, at least in the city of Fort Worth. So that's why they had to give us a variance on the code because changing code is not very fast or reliable, you know, very happens very <laughs> often, but they gave us a variance on all of our projects. We have been using uh, GPON, so we have an ONT in every guest room uh, that serves two guest rooms at the same time. Uh, but then we also have a copper network uh, that runs, that controls all of our POE technology. Mm -hmm. We have the Cisco switches in each guest room, and it all it is all tied back to a main switch um, using copper. But what's powering the Cisco switches? Typically, it would be traditional AC. What we're doing is powering it with a with another technology called digital electricity, which, if you're not familiar with that, it's a company called Volt Server. So they send energy, but in packets. So that's why it's called digital electricity. They send, I think, it's 400 packets a second, and so the electricity is pulsed down a copper two pair or four pair, um, and then it reaches the destination, which what you see right now is the transmitter, and those are the racks you see. Those are powering all of the lighting, motors, mini bars, mirrors for our entire project. The Volt server technology is um, one of the key components into being able to create a digital building yeah. or a, a fully DC powered building uh, because the uh, energy that comes down those cables is touch safe. Mm -hmm. uh, you can't hurt yourself touching it. You, it's not going to start any fires by sparking. Um, it doesn't arc like uh, AC power does. And uh, you can even send that power um, on a 18-2, uh, just speaker wire. You can send about 1,100 watts of power up to 6,500 feet. So what you see here, it's a little messy, but every single guest room has either one or two Cisco switches, which is what those two black boxes are. Those are called digital building switches. They don't have fans. Uh, they're plenum rated, so it's really, um, really works for the guest room because they're not going to make any noise. What you see to the left of the picture, another black box, that is our ONT, which is part of the PON network. And that's going to be connected to the fiber um, and then all the access points um, and the televisions in the room. So that's going to give us the internet uh, uh, to the guest while the Cisco switches on the right are gonna give you all the PoE power, lighting shades, et cetera, everything we've talked about. Um, and then you'll see on top of the black Cisco switches, there's a little gray box, a little hard to see. That's the Volt server receiver. So we're pulsing that power from the basement, which we saw earlier, all the way up to that receiver, which is then powering the Cisco switches. And then you see another black box on top of the second shelf, and that is a Kohler product called DTV, which is a digital thermostatic valve. So basically our showers are all digital as well. We have just a touch panel that you go in and you, there's no handles. You just, you change your water temperature, you change what head you want to use. And those are not PoE right now, but they only take about 25 watts of power. So we're going to work for our next project to make those PoE as well. So we're in a typical guest room. 
those are our wall controllers that we've developed with new leds um, the company that makes them is called 4d systems but we've integrated with all the lighting and shade so you saw she selected a scene on there she selected the good morning scene and it opened everything up made it nice and bright we've got a couple other scenes on there this is the 4d uh touch screen uh, you can see if i wave my hand in front of it it's got a proximity sensor so that when the guest walks up they can uh, it'll come on for them uh, it's a touch screen uh, so you can see we've got a bunch of uh, custom made um, buttons on there. Uh, we've just got an on off button and then some scenes. We can also do um, some things uh, like uh, control the window shades on here uh, and just pretty much anything we want to do. We can program it on this uh, controller and we can do it. And the nice thing about these is it is just a cat5 cable to the back and it comes off of i've got the new ledge driver here as well um they've got some ports on the back here that uh power the wall controllers so obviously we have our own <clears throat> lighting manufacturer that we actually manufacture all of our lights custom mm -hmm. amazing they're estelle's lighting they're out of houston uh they're approved marriott and hilton vendors so they're they're a great partner if you want to make some amazing custom fixtures. Um, New LEDs is our LPOE lighting driver company. We have Somfy window shades, of course. We have Dometic, which they make our mini bars. And we have Electric Mirror. They are our mirror company. Um, who else do we have? Asa Abloy makes door locks, and they're all POE. Um, some other lighting manufacturers that we've been working with. Um, include, uh, or sorry, the driver manufacturers mm -hmm. include Igor, uh, Platformatics. Platformatics. Um, they've they've got some good stuff out there as well. Mm -hmm. uh, so our our sensor company, they make Bluetooth sensors. They're called Ivani, and they basically uh, take a traditional occupancy sensor, which may be motion based or maybe infrared, and they replace that with um, <clears throat> Bluetooth sensors. And so you're creating a Bluetooth mesh in your environment. And then when, when you walk through it, you're mostly water. So you disrupt that mesh and it can tell you that someone's in the room. Um, and they can, they can do a lot with this technology. They can <clears throat> do people counting. We're working with them on doing geofencing. Um, so they have a lot of kind of capabilities that they're working towards. We're working Ooh. with Meraki access points. Mm -hmm. uh, the Cisco company. Yeah, they're Cisco. So we have two cabling companies. We primarily work with a local company called DMI, mm -hmm. and they're doing all of our in-room cabling and fiber. And then we had another company that we're we're close partners with, but they're out of San Antonio. That's TerraBridge. We've been getting we're working closely with uh, Superior Essex. Uh, they actually make the Powerwise cable, which mm -hmm. is a 22 gauge Cat5 cable, so it can. Um, power some things that uh, a normal Cat5 wouldn't be able to. One of the important things to know about the wattage uh, for mm -hmm. these POE uh, fixtures is that um, however much wattage you have coming out of your POE port, that is your budget for your fixtures. So it's not one fixture to one port. Mm -hmm. It's um, 60 watts to X number of fixtures. So uh, right now we have a lot of fixtures that are four and a half watts. Mm -hmm. So we can get about 10 to 12 of those usually on a single port. Uh, and you can adjust the, the levels of those to get more if you want. If you want less light, but more um, actual fixtures, you can get them on there. Depending on your lighting driver manufacturer, which ours is new LEDs. So they have up to eight channels on their drivers. So we can potentially individually control eight uh, eight or more fixtures completely individually um, and they don't have to be daisy chained together they can just be wired into different channels so what we've done in the hotel is we've distributed we put the switches in every room and that way the runs are just from in room to in room and they're much shorter and they're much easier to pull and uh, makes it a lot more accessible for um, the maintenance to know exactly where the switches are for each each device so that's the direction we've changed to. And we found that um, it saves tons of money on copper. 
spend some money on labor because you're not doing these huge long poles. And we can actually also determine the exact length of every cable before we do the room. So we can buy pre-terminated cables because we know that it's only 20 feet or 30 feet. And then we buy that and during install, it makes it so much faster. Well, we actually are using a company called Opterna and they make these really cool products where they, they put fiber in this spool and in a little box. And so you pull the fiber out of the spool to where you want it to go. And then all remaining fiber stays spooled up in the box um, because it just keeps cable management and keeps the fiber protected and just makes it really easy to, you know, keep it nice and coiled in the box and you just pull it right out to the length you need and the rest stays right in there. Every high rise building is required to have backup power and it's typically in the form of a diesel generator. And that gives you emergency life for elevators, lighting, uh, stairway pressurization, anything that falls under the UL code of 927. So it is required to have two hours of emergency backup. So and that's uh, 924. 924. We found this system, which is called the ESS hmm. system, energy storage system, and it had another UL stamp. It didn't have the quite correct one that we needed, but when, when we saw the system, it had a lot of the same features as what you would need in a 924. And so we were saying, wow, this is great. Called UL, said, hey, UL, we have this idea. We want to make UL 924. We want to make it lithium ion. And we have this great product and we think it'll work. And they said, hey, that's a great idea. We'll send our engineer to China, or he's a Chinese engineer, but he went to Korea and he tested it. And he said, this is a great product. Uh, let's put it on site and test it here. And we we're able to get the UL stamp on it about a month ago. Yeah. So this is the first battery system that is a UL 924 rated lithium ion battery system. And it's sitting right in the Sinclair. So yeah. Getting configurations recorded and stored and creating a database for those for your facilities is going to be more and more important. <laughs> we need to get better as an industry and as, as service providers at how we capture and give to our owners and to users like Hannah and Nathan and, and the people we work with records of what their configurations are. We do have a database and we wrote all the configurations for our property ourselves. So it's easy for us to keep it in store, but the, the interesting part is gonna be, we aren't the ones managing the hotel. Marriott is managing this hotel. So it's a whole learning curve for your facilities team because it seems it's going to feel a lot more like IT than it is facilities, traditional facilities. That was awesome, Maria. I can tell you the, the, the time I spent reviewing the footage that I did with Nathan, that we did with Nathan and Hannah, fantastic. I mean, guys, you got a master class in that particular technology. Mm -hmm. Couldn't beat it. No, and there was so many questions that the audience had that day. Um, it was just lots of interest in that. So it was a very, very good show. It was a good show. Not surprised show. to see that it made it to the top three. No, no, not at all. Not at all. Well, you know what? I reached out to Hannah and Nathan for an update of what they've been up to, especially with the, the whole COVID-19 thing. Oh, yes. And this is what they said they have been up to. So let me shoot you guys over. Hi, guys. This is Hannah and Nathan from Sinclair. Since you last saw us, we have uh, opened the hotel. It was beautiful, grand, and then closed it because of COVID. So unfortunately, um, that's where we are, but we did get about three months of guests. Um, we were having great occupancy. People were really enjoying the technology, um, that we were getting great energy efficiency. So I think it's a really good start for our first all POE hotel. So that's the update on our Sinclair project. Um, other than that, we've been doing a lot of uh, other things on our own. We started up our own, uh, another company, Sinclair Digital, to design and consult for other low voltage projects. Um, and we've gotten a couple different uh, clients and contracts for that. And we've also continued to kind of push the envelope as far as what PoE power can do. Um, so we're looking into a lot of different things like PoE motors uh, so that we can power fan coils and um, anything else really that has a motor in it. And then also we're looking into 
um, using supercapacitors to replace batteries for a couple different systems like hair dryers, maybe irons, and even elevators in a building. So stay tuned for some more crazy POE stuff. <laughs> Bye. Bye. So thank you again, Hannah and Nathan. You guys are awesome. Even though you you got shut down so off so soon after you opened the hotel, yeah. it breaks our heart. But uh, that was you guys are so awesome for having come on the show. Um, all of you guys out there who are watching the show, if you'd like Nathan and Hannah um, back on the show, do another round. Let us know. Shoot us a comment. Um, we'd love to be able to hang out with them again. And get to spend some time with because they're they're great people. Oh, definitely. Yeah. yeah. Great stuff to say. Yeah. We do have a comment from the first video or the first recap. It was from Chris. He said he's been playing with the Lightning PoE adapter um, that he got when he visited. He found Th that the you adapter. You want to throw it up on the screen? Oh, thought I hit it. Sorry. <laughs> oh yeah, it's not going up for some reason. It's all right. Let me see if I can get it up there with the comment. But go ahead and read it out. Uh, but he said he does found that the adapter works great when he plugs it into a fresh port each time on the switch. He said that doing that helps the iOS device get a fresh IP every time. Very cool. Very awesome. cool. So, um, doo -doo -doo -doo, I'm trying to figure out where it went. Ah, there we go. That's the problem. Try and hit it again, Maria. All Let's right. see if we that got way that everyone one. everyone can see it. There you go. Hey, thanks, Chris, for saying that. I've been, that's, that's very awesome of you, man. As you can tell, we're having some little production challenges today. A little bit. Um, so thank you, Chris. Thanks for doing the testing. Let us know how that works for you guys with the JF Lightning PD, and if you've been up to anything uh, new with respect to PoE lighting and automation. Because our next video, uh, they have been up to a ton of things. <laughs> so yeah. we've been we've been hanging out with these Igor guys for the past year. Love seeing them whenever we see them. We did uh, we did the Smart Building Summit. You can go back and see that live stream with them. Uh, we live streamed with Matt during a uh, Bixie Fall Conference last mm -hmm. year. So it's been a wild and exciting time for Pee Wee Lighting and Automation. And I can tell you the market has been changing and really growing. So don't fall behind. I'm actually going to bring up, um, and I apologize, I should have had this up uh, when, I, I should have had this up the whole time when we were talking. But we, thus talking to PoE, sorry, Igor Lighting. I'm yeah. going to get my tongue caught up. <laughs> Why don't we dive into seeing the refresh of our interview with Dwight Stewart, founder at Igor. Yes. Everyone I talk to at shows and online wants to know more about PoE Lighting. And the approach that we've taken is to make this, you know, more of a plug and play system, even in the software, so that you can create plugins to create automations and uh, interactions between these different devices. And by doing that, instead of it being this custom solution every time you do a building, it can be more of something that's repeatable with plugins and integrations that you can just go project to project. Typically with lighting control systems, the bandwidth is very narrow. And, and so you're going to send a little bits of data to turn on or off lights and that have just has to happen very quickly, more in real time. Well, power over Ethernet, IP networks can easily handle that. But then the advantage becomes, you have all this bandwidth, now you can leverage a light as a hub for data to connect sensors and actuators to that can do much more. So that's the real benefit of power over Ethernet lighting is that it can do any protocol, multiple protocols at the same time over an IP network. It's real time, high bandwidth, and it's plug and play, very agile. With our technology, we can daisy chain one node after the next, and we can connect multiple things to one node. So now you can load as much as you want, as much as you have power available. Uh, and then we have even a new node that can go up to 90 watts per port. So and the light behind you consumes anywhere from 20 to 30 watts usually. So just imagine, <laughs> you know, you're going to be able to uh, a very nice fan of white uh, moment there. <laughs> And uh, so, you know, just imagine you're able to get two or three of those lights uh, on one home run. And so those sensors that you were pointing to also, they consume maybe two watts, one watt, but hardly anything. One of the things that we also have on our newest node, going back to the data question, is, is USB port. 
So just imagine you install the system and then now a year from now, you want to put some sort of uh, device in that's available via USB. You just go to a nearby light, connect it, and now it shows itself via our API and you can kind of use that data however you want. Nodes can be programmed with just stating the make and model of certain lights or of certain uh, attached devices, sensors, and, and it will automatically adjust uh, that node to the appropriate settings. At 30 years equivalent testing that we still had no failures on any of the nodes. Uh, typically an AC DC driver inside of a light lasts maybe five years, seven years, five years is a typical warranty period and LEDs already pretty much last forever it's they'll degrade over time won't produce as much light for the same amount of power but overall with our solution you have an Igor node which lasts 30 plus years and then an LED array which lasts you know, quite a long time and you remove remove the battery so now you just made it a no maintenance type of application and once again, reducing total cost of ownership, which allows you to spend your money more wisely on things that really matter. Uh, you don't have to necessarily have the same labor class even installing, right? Because uh, instead of it being a class in, in the UL spectrum, there's class one, two, and three. And you know that high voltage above, I think it's 60 volts or 55 volts, or, it is where you enter that uh, higher voltage level, which has to be installed by electrician. But this is a class two device, which can be installed by just you know anyone that's uncertified. And uh, so it really opens up the installation capabilities, uh, as well as the safety where, let's say if you wanna move a light around, uh, you're in a retail space and you wanna change your floor layout, you don't have to go through this huge planning exercise. You could move things around much more freely and then be able to click, you know, uh, just unclick the socket and move that light, click it back in, uh, not have to worry about getting electrocuted or... I always like to point out to people too, usually the biggest problem with, with putting AC or the AC outlets up there in those spaces or an AC location is it's a one, it's a one trick pony. You, you get one use out of it where a network cable up there doing the same thing. Uh, if I'm tired of having a light there, I pull it off, I plug in a camera, it'll do a camera. I will say though, with power of reason that there's a whole negotiation process. So when you first have a wire even hanging out of the power of Ethernet switch, if you lick that, there's actually almost no power going over the wires at that point. You have to plug it in, then the power of Ethernet uh, switch negotiates and, and sees a little amount of, of uh, signal basically coming from the device it's plugged into. And if that signal indicates that it's a power over Ethernet device, then it will elevate the power and it will go through a further negotiation. So really, it's safe the whole time. Uh, personalization, I think, is a major component of where the smart building can go. So if you walk into a room and you have macular degeneration, for instance, and just poor eyesight, well, now the light could elevate up and help you. Or if you are uh, susceptible to migraines, which really uh, could be triggered by too much light, well, then the light could go down for you. There's been studies that uh, whether it's seniors that are in the senior living communities who are doing with that uh, whole sunrise to sunset and having the color of light as well as the dimming change to emulate what's outside, emulating that inside actually improves uh, memory for seniors and it, it, it enhances and, and helps with healing within healthcare. You can also, to our node, attach aromatherapy or sound and other things, right? By creating that full experience uh, and in that environment that just makes you feel more calm and, and collected. And, and a lot of times your mental state will impact your physiological state and, and thereby help you heal. One of the things that PUE Texas is doing to make PUE lighting and these types of products more affordable is we're working on our a managed PUE mid-span. And to your point, you've got this beautiful, very expensive, nice switch. It's configured for what you want it to do. This is the PoE Texas managed mid-span. Allows you to add up to 80 watts of power per port on a device. You could just slide into the rack. 
but it doesn't fiddle with the data. I'm using this switch here, which happens to be a PoE switch. This switch is sending the communicating the data on the network, and it's just adding power to these red cables. As a safe school initiative, we have gunshot detection sensors that we can attach to the lights. And now something goes off in the hallway. Imagine that the lights that are down a certain part of that hallway go red, showing that this is the epicenter of the event and other lights in the other areas stay green or you know, just stay uh, normal white color, whatever, but they could flash, they could pulse. Right? There's different effects you could do that symbolize certain things. And then we've also hooked up buzzers and other types of audio alerts so that people know what's going on. And then on our node, you can hook up, one example of how efficient the cost can be for this is if you get a strike plate or a mag lock for a door, that's a simple analog one that's you just feed it voltage and it turns on or off. That costs maybe $30. If you get a power over ethernet door lock, it could be $1,000. So by just connecting up one of those inexpensive devices up to a nearby node, which you're already using a node for a light, so really it's just the cost of that, that device. And now you can add that as well so that you can do a lockdown on the doors, let's say that are nearby the event. So People can't get into those classrooms that the gunshot just went off in. Reality for commercial and some residential applications is you have to have a lighting designer. And that's a big hurdle for anybody doing less than 10,000 square feet. I mean, unless, unless you can afford a fifteen or $20,000 lighting designer, that becomes a problem. We could help manage that process for small users. And you could come and say, I've got this 5,000 square foot space. I got this office, this office, that office. We could help put together a package for you that would be comprehensive, get your input on the light fixtures, and then supply a one package, uh, just a pallet with all the right stuff. Belden and Seaman Cat 6 cables are rated for 100 watts specifically, and they're a lot thicker. Berktech uh, has the landmark IP which is a cap 5 e cable with an extra thick conductor inside specifically for high wattage uh, four pair poe and superior essex also has their powerwise 1g um both of both of those are supposed to be good cables that are cap 5 e rated which and the difference between the cat 6 and the cap 5 e is the amount of data the transmission that they can handle is lower they're not they're not rated for the 10 gig data center quality data but they are rated for the thicker cable to allow you to handle more of these infrastructure applications that aren't data intensive but they are power intensive go for a certified cable whether it's ul etl in 2003 when i started my last company only about five percent of buildings had advanced control systems and we fast forward today about 5% of buildings have advanced control systems. Nothing's really improved. And that's pretty dramatic. Uh, the reason being is that it's been a focus on cost savings, is put this into your building. There's some immediate applications you can do right now that are gonna enhance your business. Breaking down these, what have been silos, that's for real-time data and using and having responsiveness with your environments and allowing someone to interact with their environment in a new way passively through let's say bluetooth or actively by uh, pulling on a chain or something all those things create this autonomous the opportunity to bring them together in an autonomous way digital transformation of customer experience is what i really call it and that transformation is going to be applied to everything in your life and, and we've seen it over the last few decades within the internet, but now it's starting to bleed over into the physical world. And that's gonna enhance business, it's gonna enhance your way of life, it's gonna reset your expectations for how you interact with things. Obviously, there's the light. Uh, there's this guy here. The system is made up of these general components, the PoE switch and power source, the gateway, the nodes, the attached devices, and then any kind of control interfaces you would like to have. UL 924 requires that the emergency devices themselves have to be UL 924 listed. So our node is UL 924 listed. 
However, the different components that, as long as the components don't change their function in emergency mode, then they just have to be powered with a UL924 source. You gotta make sure that the power connected to the power of Ethernet switch is UL924 certified. So either it's from a generator, it's from an inverter, from some source that satisfies that requirement. Requirement of the lights have to turn on within 10 seconds during an emergency and ours turn on within five seconds, as well as you have to have 90 minutes of emergency power. A mid-span in the backup power supply is a better alternative than some of the higher powered PoE switches, only because higher powered PoE switches uh, often will take a little bit of time to actually boot up mm -hmm. and configure and start communicating, where a mid-span, um, the, the mid-span is, is a very fast alternative to provide the power and get it up going very quickly. That was awesome. And you know, I'll tell you what, the hardest part of doing this editing was just picking like oh, the most, exactly. There was just so much good content. So guys, if you're at all interested in PeeWee lighting, go back and watch that whole show. There've been some updates, but oh, it was a fantastic show. Well, Dwight was cool enough that he came back and did an update for us on where he is today. So, awesome. so let's find out where Dwight, uh, what Dwight's been up to, especially with the new COVID situation. Record to the computer. All right, so it's recording and it's going to give us, I think, speaker view. Hopefully, hopefully Tyler can edit this. So Dwight, um, as much as possible, can you just give us a short update on where you and the company are since you last appeared on Tyler's show? Yeah, so a lot's happened in a year. It's amazing. It's not much time, but uh, we're definitely moving quickly and, and doing a lot of things. So uh, where to start? I, you know, Obviously, I'm working from my home right now just because of the changes in the world, but it's really showing that Smart buildings in general are a really important part of a business and this whole idea of digital transformation that's taking place in businesses is spreading now to the workplace. And uh, so it's really you know, helping accelerate our business. Uh, and we see that uh, in, in the way that we built out our technology, it's not just for lighting. Uh, it, we are doing a lot of other things for IoT. And so some of the new integrations that we've created are for heating, ventilation, air conditioning. So we can actually act as a virtual thermostat uh, where we can connect directly to, let's say, a VRF or a PTAC unit, which would be inside of a room. Uh, it could be in a hotel room. It could be uh, you know, serving a number of rooms in an office area. Uh, but those types of units, uh, you, you just provide some signals to. And <clears throat> via our node, we can do that now. And then we've also integrated with a touchscreen that is the same form factor as a wall control that, that's typically in a, uh, you know, like a, a wall um, switch. And that provides a lot of uh, context where you can see not, and control not only your lights, but change to a mode where you can adjust your HVAC settings as well. And ultimately it will provide other contexts uh, such as shade control, which we also have now natively integrated to Somfy and, um, and Mecco Shade and a number of others that we can uh, control and power their shades. So I'm trying to think, I mean, door closure contacts, uh, almost any kind of sensor you can imagine at this point we are integrating with. So with that kind of data and uh, this, we can now do some amazing decisioning based on that. And we've created a plugin system that's based on the data that comes in and the context, we can create small snippets of code and just load them into the system and they can be, become behaviors. So for instance, if someone gets out of bed in a senior uh, center, as they get out of bed and there's a bed sensor in their bed, we can take that and then the, have a behavior that for that bed sensor, what room is it associated with? What lights are associated to that room? And of those lights, which one are tagged as night light, turn those on to 30%. And you can see how that statement could just be one line of code and you compile it, you upload it into the system as a plugin, 
And now all you do is associate things in the system, uh, you know, bed sensors and lights to rooms and tag the lights that you want to turn on uh, when someone gets out of bed, just tag those as nightlight. So we have this concept of tagging. And it just makes things simple and easy to understand and to manage. And under, you know, if traditional controls, you'd have all sorts of code everywhere and it would be hard to know uh, what code was doing what and to make changes. But in our system, now you can just see these are the list of plugins, these are the list of behaviors. If I no longer want that behavior, I can either untag a light as nightlight or I can unload a plugin. Uh, and so as the world moves to having a, an incredible density of devices per square foot, as well as diversity of devices from all sorts, sorts of different vendors per square foot, uh, it really needs to be that simple to create integrations and automations and behaviors. Uh, and these plugins can do all of that. They can do integrations, they can do the behaviors I mentioned, they can do user interfaces where we can have apps that are effectively in our application. Uh, and so it's a pretty exciting time for us to be able to have all of these components that uh, are, are quick to deploy. Um, a couple other little teasers that, you know, we now have integration to uh, products that do heartbeat sensing, heartbeat monitoring from a distance using micro Doppler or uh, breathing rate micro Doppler. Uh, so it's, you know, the sensors that are coming out and the data that we're now able to bring onto the platform is just incredible. Okay, and then of course, Tyler might edit there or he might, hopefully he cuts me out here, um, but.